What's up, everyone? Welcome back to Moonlight Game Devs, the podcast where game developers share the story behind their games and the lessons learned with their fellow developers. Today, I had a chat with Nathaniel Ayer, who is an ex CIA agent who moved to Egypt to pursue a indie game development business. Really interesting to hear what he has to share and the lessons you learn. And yeah, I hope you guys enjoy. What's up, Nathaniel? Welcome to the show. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really good for you to come on. I'm really excited to speak to you because um, I know you got a really interesting kind of background story. I first kind of noticed that, you know, you posted under like a, a game dev thread on Reddit, you know, that you were kind of realized the, I guess, the dream that many, many of us have, which is, you know, working on games full time, starting their own games businesses. And I think a lot of people, they kind of fantasize about, you know, if I just lived in a different country where living costs are a bit lower than, you know, selling an online product like a game could possibly subsidize, you know, allow me to live the same lifestyle that I have sort of in a different country, but I still get to kind of make games and, and do something that I'm really passionate about. And you've actually gone and done that. You've moved to Egypt. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that's correct. Yes. I lived, fr- uh, used to live in Virginia, uh, where the uh, near Washington, D.C. and the cost of living was really high. And this would have been completely impossible there. Uh, I moved to Cairo, Egypt, where the cost of living is much lower, but uh, it has been very, very difficult. It's been very challenging. Uh, It it did make full-time development possible, but it's not something I would recommend to everyone. All right. Awesome. Um, Thanks for for kind of already, you know, getting into kind of explaining all of those things. I hope we can kind of, you know, Get more into that and, and kind of your recommendations on, and kind of the things lessons learned from from taking that step. But maybe we should begin with you kind of introducing yourself, maybe your background story, and kind of how things led up to you making this uh, this big move. Yeah, sure. So uh, my story is um, not typical. It's a uh, it's pretty unique, I would say. Uh, so I moved to Virginia because uh, I was working for the CIA and I worked there for about nine years and everything was fantastic. It was great until suddenly it wasn't. And um, I became very, very disillusioned with the whole thing. And, uh, and things were kind of starting to improve, but by the time they did, I had just completely lost interest in working for the government, and I had to just do something different. And the uh, while everything was going wrong, uh, I was kind of tempted to just withdraw into playing a video game, and that was just something that I've always done. And... But this time I kind of thought to myself, well, look, if I just play a video game, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not improving anything. And so I had always wanted to make a video game. And so that's what I decided to do instead. And so uh, I took all of the frustration that I was feeling at work and I channeled that into making a video game. And uh, so that's how I got started. Can you tell us kind of the details there of how you got started? Um... Like, what kind of tools did you use and, and how did you, you know, teach yourself? Were you like a, a programmer or something like that? Did you know some have that kind of background? Sure. So um, the the background that kind of led me into video game development was, first off, a love for video games and a love for telling stories. And um, playing Dungeons and Dragons as a kid and being the dungeon master. And I just really enjoyed creating adventures and and sharing those with my friends. Um, in college, I did start off in computer engineering and I, I did uh, kind of start on uh, uh, to learn computer programming there, but um, but I ended up majoring in Middle Eastern studies and and learning Arabic instead. So uh, most of my programming experience was kind of self-taught. Uh, this was years ago when I uh, first started looking into video game development when the Unreal Development Kit, UDK, was kind of the, the top tier product for people who wanted to get into video game development. And, uh, and so I downloaded UDK and taught myself how to use everything in it and 
the first part of, of making my video game was making something playable in UDK. Uh, and then as I started getting more and more advanced and wanting to do more and more with the, with the game, then I would start uh, trying out different, different tools and different programs. And eventually I reached out into Photoshop and Flash and After Effects and uh, World Machine and just a, a, a wide variety of tools that helped me to, to build all of the different assets that I needed in the game. Mm. So is that still kind of the, the fa fundamental fun foundation for your game today? So did you create some different games before uh, starting work on your current project, which is an all process, process, right? Uh, Himeko Story and AR, uh, JRPG? Um, or, or did you kind of, you know, continuously work on this project on the side and then, you know, now eventually you decided to make it a, your main sort of game? Yeah, so I never really made a complete game before. Mostly what I did was I, I started up UDK and I said, okay, I'm going to make a third person camera. And then I made the, the character that you could move around and then the camera would follow her or him from the third person view. And then I said, okay, now I want to uh, add a pause menu. And then uh, you press escape and it'll open a pause menu. And then I said, okay, now I want to uh, add a click to move. And, and then I just added one thing at a time and I just kept adding on. And eventually it became this huge strategy game. <laughs> yeah, just kind of the mechanics there building on top of each other. Yeah, quite common, I think, occurrence for, for a project kind of just building on top of different things while you're learning. So just want to talk about kind of that, you know, you already touched upon it, that you kind of were a little bit fed up with your, your current job. And then at some point, you made that decision to to actually move all the way to Egypt. Can you tell us a little bit about that, like that build up there and, you know, how you kind of prepared for such a big step? Yeah. It must have probably been very difficult. Yeah, yeah, it was very difficult. Um, and just making the decision was really difficult. You know, even though I had gotten to the point where I really hated my job, I also had a mortgage and I, I'm married and I've got kids and uh, we've got bills to pay. And, you know, I had a government job that was very, very stable. I mean, it almost requires an act of Congress to get somebody fired from a government job. I mean, that was stability that I could depend on for as long as I wanted it. And I had a really, really hard time walking away from that, even though I had become so disillusioned with my job. Uh, but my wife, uh, mostly, she was the one who saw how miserable I was. And she was kind of the one who insisted, no, look, we have to do something. We have to make a change. And Uh, so we both speak Arabic and, uh, she had lived in Egypt before and she thought that it would be, she really wanted us to try to move to Egypt, uh, because it had a very low cost of living and she really likes it here. So that's what we did. And the big hurdles for us were, uh, well, quitting a job and, uh, clearing out all of our, uh, our possessions in our house and we ended up renting out our house and then uh, buying tickets and to fly here and then finding a place to stay temporarily while looking for an apartment and then getting up an apartment and and trying to do all of this in a foreign language and so uh, there were lots of hurdles lots of steps lots of um, lots of problems that we had to work through but uh, If you're going to make a big change, then it's going to take some work. Yeah, definitely. Thanks so much for explaining that. And yeah, that sounds like a just an incredible transition as well. Like, do you guys still make some, some income through that, that rental property? So we make very, very little. Uh, mostly it just covers the mortgage and then... Uh, and then the fee that we pay to the property manager, we're not looking at it as any kind of money maker. Uh, it does provide us just a very, very tiny amount of income, but we set all of that aside to pay for repairs to the property. So it's not 
a moneymaker for us. We're just holding on to the house. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, I hope it's not too personal question, but I was just curious kind of, you know, how to, how you, your kind of sources of income as a game developer. It's like, I know you have the game out and so an early access. So, you know, listeners, if they're interested in, in this RPG kind of games, then definitely check them out. But what was the kind of state what, of the game, for example, when you, when you actually went to Egypt? Was it already kind of making money? Was it already out or was it? No. Uh, so the game was not out yet. And uh, it was not really in a state where I could let other people play it yet. I mean, I, I had different demos, different stages of things that people could try out, but it was in no way resembling a, a playable game. As for income, what I tell people about that is years of smart financial decisions gave me the freedom to make a very stupid financial decision. And if you just look at it in terms of how much money I would have made at my old job versus how much money I'm making now, then it's, there's no comparison at all. I mean, it's, uh, if that's the only measurement used to compare the two decisions, then this was the worst possible thing I could have done. Uh, but it is only in early access and, uh, and, uh, we have started seeing some sales from it, uh, which is nice. But um, no, mostly we planned on just moving here and getting by on very, very little income. Uh, my wife teaches some classes for a, a university online, and, and we were thinking, okay, well, that's going to be our income. And, uh, but mostly we were thinking, okay, well, because of the low cost of living and the, uh, the nice exchange rate, that's going to be what's, uh, what's going to keep us going. But uh, since then, uh, I did start the game in early access where it's doing reasonably well for a, a single developer project. It's, it's got about 20,000 wish lists. Uh, sales have provided about $40,000 in income. Uh, but that's, that's not enough money to get by in America, but it's enough to get by here. Yeah, I was going to say um, that actually, you know, for... for... Egypt, if I'm not mistaken, kind of how much you need to get by, you know, you seeing that your game got released on early access in, you know, 2019. So you're, is it fair to say that you've been having sales for about a year now? Uh, yeah, yeah, over a year now. Uh, so uh, actually almost, almost two years. But the, uh, yeah, so the, the money is enough to get by here in Egypt. We, we live in a, a three-bedroom apartment in a, a nice part of town, and, uh, and we're not worried about money, but uh, it's definitely uh, far from the, uh, the lifestyle that we had before, and also the lifestyle of your average expats living here in Egypt. So you said that at the beginning, pretty early in the episode, you wouldn't recommend this for anyone, everyone. So... Who would you recommend doing this? To? Like, would you say that even that you would recommend it to yourself to do it again? Well, uh, that's hard to say. I think that that is going to depend on uh, how sales do after uh, after the game is released into uh, the the full release. Uh, but my wife, though, says that that's not a healthy way of looking at it. The what I should look at is I was unhappy in my job. I had to make a change. And this was the change available, and it was something that I had wanted to do. And so I try to keep that in mind. I don't always succeed. Uh, but as for who else I would recommend it to, I would say only people who this is the only thing that they can do or want to do if they are stuck in something that they just cannot do any longer, then, yeah, go ahead and do it. But I would say for most people, if you have financial obligations, if you have uh, become attached to a certain level of, of economic consumption, then you should, if you want to do game development, then you should probably do game development on the side. Do it as a hobby. Do it to make very, very small games, very limited in scope. But if you absolutely have to become a full-time developer and you have the finances to get you started and to keep you going for 
at least twice as long as you think it'll take to get your game to completion, then all right, go ahead and do it. I think that's uh, really detailed and you know, just from my understanding, I've never done it personally, but it seems like a really reasonable like um, estimation and, and recommendation there in terms of, you know, the risks and everything involved there and all the things you need to consider. So um, definitely thanks for sharing that. And I also kind of want to transition the conversation to actually the sort of development of it as well. And, you know, you mentioned there that it kind of the game kind of began as, as a hobby project uh, and you were kind of built it up in scope. Um, can you tell us kind of how the game idea actually evolved from that and how it kind of crystallized? Because I'm assuming at the beginning, you didn't really have that final vision of, of what the game is today in, in mind, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. Not at all. Um, yeah. The, uh, the, the first thing I started working on is nothing at all like what we have right now. So uh, what happened was my little brother who was a teenager at the time was just having a really rough time. And my dad was uh, having difficulty connecting with them. And all my little brother wanted to do was play video games. And the Oculus Rift was on Kickstarter at the time. And I thought, uh, hey, dad, uh, there's, I've got this idea. Why don't you back the Oculus Rift? I will, I'll do it too. We'll both get a Rift. Uh, you can build a gaming PC with my little brother. You can hook the Rift up to it. There are no games for the Rift right now, but, uh, but we can learn how to program video games. And that will be something that we can do together. And that'll be uh, something uh, that my little brother would be interested in. And, uh, and hopefully that would be something that we can connect over. And, and so uh, that's kind of what got me started in, uh, in trying out some different things. And I, uh, I had been playing a lot of uh, uh, Mountain Blade Warband at the time. And I thought, wouldn't it be fun if you could be in virtual reality and you have your army all around you and you could give orders to them and you can say, OK, you guys move over here. And so the kind of the first thing that I did in uh, making a video game that ended up becoming part of Himeko Story is uh, having a formation of soldiers and telling them to move somewhere. And so uh, uh, that was kind of the, the basis, uh, the foundation of the combat in Himeko Story. And then I thought, well, you know what? I really, really liked the game Ogre Battle 64. Uh, it was a fantastic game on the Nintendo 64, released about 20 years ago, and they haven't done a sequel to it. And, uh, and people just loved that game. And uh, people are always saying, man, you know what I wish that they would bring back? Ogre Battle. And so I thought, yeah, yeah, I should do a game that's kind of like Ogre Battle, where you have an army and, uh, and you organize it into squads and you send the squads into battle. So the unit of your army isn't individual soldiers and you don't give orders to individual soldiers. But you, you send the, the foundation of your army, the unit of your army is the squad, and you give orders to the squad, and then the squad kind of fights autonomously after you give it orders. And so uh, those, were the, those were the things that kind of started me on, uh, on making uh, the game that we have right now. Yeah, that makes, that, that's, thanks for, for sharing that and explaining that. It's really interesting. Did you kind of also uh, evolve the idea as, you know, you mentioned there that you showed some some prototypes even before you, you traveled to Egypt? Um, did the kind of early access or, you know, uh, players just playing your game before um, kind of shape the idea as well? What were some of the feedback that you were getting from people? So at first it was... Um... The, the first thing I did that I showed to other people was kind of a little demo that I let uh, Kickstarter backers try out. And it was, a, it was basically just the combat and, uh, and then you could also uh, like change the equipment and change character classes on your characters. And there was a very simple story. And that was something that I let people try out. And they said, it was enough for them to say, okay, yeah, there's something here. This is 
this is a game that could be developed into something that's actually fun. Uh, but, I mean, at the time, it was definitely not a complete game. But it was enough for people to see there's something here. And so I took that and I, I worked on it some more. And eventually it became something that I was more confident in being able to show people and uh, and so I released it into early access, and that's where the player feedback really got started. And uh, the player feedback definitely has been a huge help. As a lone developer, I have only my own ideas, and so you know, if I were part of a team where there were different people who were uh, uh, specialized in their own areas of game development, then I would be able to uh, to talk to them and and they would be able to uh, come up with ideas and contribute and and then we could build a better game but I didn't have that big team uh, there's just me and then uh, I had uh, some contractors who I would pay and I would uh, have them submit you know a piece of pixel art or or a song or uh, just little bits and pieces here but I had to put it all together myself and so uh, because it was just me doing all that, uh, I didn't have all of the ideas that a team could provide. And so that's why going into early access was great for development, because then I could get players to say, hey, I like this. I don't like this. I wish it had this. And then I, I've taken all of their feedback. And that's something that I've tried to be uh, very, very diligent about is reading and responding to all player feedback and it's it's their feedback that has helped me to make the game that it is today which people i think are really enjoying so far yeah yeah it's great to hear and i think you pinpointed yeah one of the biggest challenges that i'm experiencing myself as well kind of solo developing the game you don't really have anyone to bounce ideas back and you know back and forth with um personally yeah i feel like you know, you can ask friends or family members, but you never know how kind of biased that feedback is. Yeah. So it's it's definitely difficult, but um, exactly. Like once you get into the early access phase and you have that re real feedback of people who actually want the game to be really good uh, and who've already spent inv invested money, so spent money and have a, <laughs> some investment in the game, they want it to be really as good as possible. So I feel like that's really the way you get the most genuine feedback to improve it as well. Yeah. And, you know, there are, I noticed that a lot of people, uh, maybe they're trying to get genuine feedback by going to a forum or someplace like Reddit and they say, hey, what would you think about a video game that does this? And I hate reading those posts. <laughs> and I think that most people hate reading those posts because that's the idea guy and everyone hates yeah. the idea guy. Everybody has an idea for what to do in a video game. And it takes somebody who can actually make a video game, somebody who can actually create art and program and put it together. And so uh, it's, it's really hard to say, hey, what do you think about this idea for a video game? Because everybody's got ideas. What you have to do is you have to have some kind of base of a video game for people to play. And then you can add something to it. And then you can say, hey, what do you think of this change? And what would you think if I made this hypothetical change? And then you've got something to work with. Uh, but uh, to all of your listeners, yeah, don't just have this idea and go to a forum or Reddit and say, hey, what would you think about this for a video game? Don't do that. Just make a video game and then make a change to it and see how people react to the change. Yeah, often there's even like an entire subreddit just called Game Ideas. And I had to unsubscribe at some point because <laughs> you know, either the ideas are just really, they're either ridiculous or they're like, it's, it's just kind of useless. I wouldn't say useless to think about good game ideas. I feel like it's really important. But uh, like you said, usually the best game ideas, they just come from, they don't really sound that exciting. Like they sound like, you know, taking an old game that's already really popular and, and kind of, putting your own little spin on it or combining ideas and things like that. So people want the really exciting, like crazy game idea that's never been thought of before. But yeah, every time somebody asks me, hey, what would you think of this idea for a video game? My answer is always the same. 
it's always sounds great. Try it out and see what happens. Yeah, exactly. You know, you were mentioning there that you know you were on Kickstarter as well, and, and you got back. Congratulations! Oh yeah, thanks. Can you tell us a little bit about you know that was quite a while back, is it? Wasn't it like oh, three yeah, years? Yeah. It was. It was a long time ago. Um, I want to say about five years ago now. And um, yeah, this is uh, another tip. Uh, development is going to take a lot longer than you think it is. So um, I did have a very very modest little Kickstarter. And it was a $10,000 goal. I ended up getting about $11,000. And, uh, and that was really just, um, you know, what it says, a kickstart. Uh, it wasn't all of the money I could have dreamed for to make, uh, to make a whole game, but it was enough to get the project moving. And I knew if I could get that seed money, then I could make the video game. And... So uh, something that they don't really tell you about Kickstarter is that, uh, you know, right now there are, or, well, it's been going on for years now. There are so many people trying to fund video games on Kickstarter that it's not really any longer a reliable uh, funding method. You really have to do a lot of the work on your own. And, and so kind of the... Uh, the approach now uh, that uh, people don't like to admit it, but this is what works, is uh, you create a Kickstarter campaign and then you have to do all of the legwork to bring in the first 50% of, you know, you going out and contacting everyone in all of your social circles in real life and on the internet and wherever it is you go where people play video games and you uh, get them to contribute to your Kickstarter. And then if you can bring in half, Kickstarter can bring in the other half. And that's, uh, it's something that people don't like to admit. And it's, uh, it's kind of something that people don't, they just don't like the idea because they think, well, wait a minute, you're getting funding from outside Kickstarter. And I'm thinking, well, no, I'm, I'm getting funding from Kickstarter, but these people who are interested just because I happen to know them from, you know, other places, they're, they're funding the Kickstarter. Uh, so I guess to sum up, uh, Kickstarter is, is kind of a rough place to go for funding now, but it was, it worked for me. And for somebody who's willing to put in a lot of effort, if you think that you can bring in about half the money on your own, then yeah, maybe Kickstarter can get you the visibility you need to other people who can get you the other half. Yeah, I think that's really practical advice there. You know, make sure, you, I think a lot of common advice nowadays for Kickstarters is first of all, don't keep the budget too high. And the second most common advice that I hear these days, at least for modern Kickstarters, is yeah, bring your own community. Like by all means, you know, make sure that you have a following or have some people that are already interested in your game. So that you can actually, you know, no pun intended, but actually kickstart the Kickstarter. Yeah. Having people that are already investing in it and then kind of getting the ball rolling. Because quite frankly, if you have like a hundred hundred dollar pledge after a few days, then, you know, not even Kickstarter is really going to notice it. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. You have to, uh, you have to do the work to bring in that first, like you said, the kickstart to the Kickstarter. And then once it has some momentum, then Kickstarter will say, oh, hey. Here's something that people are interested in. We're going to show it to other people. Yeah. And I mean, a lot of people, you know, it's really common to nowadays to see actually, you know, pay-per-click advertising for, for Kickstarter campaigns, people calculating, okay, um, if I play this in this many Facebook ads, uh, um, then, you know, I'm making this much money on my Kickstarter campaign. And um, so it's just completely changed. It kind of went from just being, you know, if you're on Kickstarter, there's like a decent chance just for being one of the first people on there that you would get some attention and money that, but nowadays, yeah, like you said, it's, it's not really the case. Yeah. And uh, what's even worse is now, uh, now it's starting to be dominated by AAA developers and they go there and they say, Hey, this is the sequel to the beloved game that you've been waiting for. And instead of, you know, getting funding from their usual publisher, or maybe it's the publisher who says, well, hey, uh, let's let's reduce our risk and let's let the community fund this game. 
And so I think that's kind of unfortunate because I kind of thought of Kickstarter as a way for the little guy to get funding. But I guess, you know, that's life. Uh, if it works, then the people who are interested in it, uh, they're going to they're going to go there and they're going to look for funding there, too. And sometimes that means big companies are going to move in. And well, that's that's just the way it goes. I've not seen that, but I can definitely see how it would make sense for a big company to validate their idea. Mm -hmm. uh, just like it makes sense for a small, small indie studio to validate the game idea by, you know, putting up a Kickstarter, right? People are really like the idea, then they're going to put up money up front. And that's just a great way to, that's just a great business move, right? Yeah. Uh, so I want to kind of talk about, uh, you know, you got funding. So um, uh, 10K from what I saw. Yeah. So how did, how did you kind of invest that money? Um if you don't mind sharing that. Yeah, I spent almost all of it on uh, 2D art. So uh, there was a, a pixel artist uh, who I used to work with, and uh, I, I got a lot of the first uh, pixel art assets from him. And uh, he, he also had this uh, company where what he would do was he would, uh, he had a bunch of other artists and he would, say well this artist's style would be good for this and so would you like to uh he was like kind of a middleman for other artists and so uh so i got a lot of pixel art from him and then he got me some of the uh the portraits for the characters from another one of his artists and so most of the money went to that uh then also there's a composer uh his name is kevin Wan. he is amazing and uh And I also gave some of the money to him to get some original music for Himeko Story. And I've been very pleased with the, uh, with the music that he has provided. Uh, besides that, uh, there were some software licenses that I had to pay for that were kind of a big upfront purchase. Uh, and then uh, besides that, I mean, I did not take... I did not pocket any of that Kickstarter money. That was entirely money that I knew that I needed to to buy stuff that I needed to get the game moving. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. And like, assuming, are you kind of uh, assuming that you outsourced a lot of kind of the, I guess, um, art aspects of the game? Is that still kind of what, where you're investing um, your money in? Or is it something that, you know, you mentioned learning Photoshop earlier? Are you kind of someone who is... Who is sort of doing everything, but, you know, just outsourcing a little bit here and there. Can you kind of tell us when, when do you decide I'm going to outsource an asset like the music or some piece of pixel art versus doing it yourself? Uh, so early on, maybe my decision might have been, okay, well, how much time would it take me to do this versus how much time would it take someone else to do this? And how satisfied would I be with my own work versus how satisfied would I be with someone else's work? And I would kind of do the math on that and say, okay, well, should I do it or would it be better to have somebody else do it? Now, uh, I kind of have to do everything. The one thing that I cannot do is music. I have zero capability uh, to produce music. And so that I still have to rely on Kevin for the music. And also uh, some of Himeko Story's music is uh, it's library music. Uh, you you go out and you buy music the same way you would buy uh, stock photos. And so I do use a lot of that music still in Himeko Story, and I'm slowly replacing it with stuff that Kevin has done. Uh, but uh, uh, besides that, I have started doing almost everything on my own. Uh, from uh, I've started... Uh, learning how to draw pixel art. Uh, I've learned how to draw portraits. And so um, most of the art that I would have purchased before, I'm doing it myself now. Awesome. That's really cool that you're kind of, yeah, stepping away from needing to pay so much and, and kind of being kind of self-sufficient, being the person who can I kind of do every aspect, I guess, music aside. Uh, one thing I guess I also want to talk about is kind of the daily regimen of, you know, keeping yourself accountable. We already talked about, you know, it's kind of hard as a solo developer already kind of an extra hurdle of not being able to cop that instant feedback versus when you're like working with someone else, like having a second pair of eyes just to look over your work. That's one downside. But then there's also that kind of, you don't have anyone who's telling you 
that you got to work. You don't have anyone telling you, you know, what to prioritize. It's all something that you got to do. So is there a special way that you kind of, kind of do that to kind of keep yourself on track and make sure that you're getting things done? Yes. Yes. Uh, so, um, this is another thing. Uh, this job cannot be done by somebody who doesn't have a lot of discipline. And really that's the thing that, uh, that keeps me going. It's unfortunately, you know, it's no longer uh, love for making video games or, or wanting to tell a story or, or, you know, there's, there's really no more excitement in this. This has unfortunately become very much a job. And, uh, and so the reason why I'm doing it, why I'm still working on it is discipline because I know this is my job. This is what I'm doing now. Uh, there was a, there was an artist, uh, who I, I really like his art and I followed him on, uh, on Twitter and he, he occasionally has these kind of profound things to say about, uh, what it's like being a creative and what it's like, uh, having art being your job. And what the thing that he said was, uh, if you do it only when you want to do it, then it's a hobby. But if you do it every day because you you have to do it, then then it's your job. It's I'm I'm ruining the quote. I have no idea how he actually said it, but the point <laughs> is you when you have a job, you do it because it's your job. And so he has decided to make art his job. And uh and that's basically what I decided that I'm gonna do. And I keep doing it every single day because this is my job now. And uh and you know, there are there are other things that I realize, you know, I, I owe it to my family that we've made such a big sacrifice that I'm going to see this through. And I owe it to my Kickstarter backers who gave me money for a game that wasn't finished. It was only the idea of a game, the promise of a game. And and I owe it to them to finish. And then now I have all of these early access players and they said, hey, we are going to give you money because this is uh, this looks very promising and we like it and we want you to finish it. And and I owe them a finished product. And so uh, I, I do have these other uh, this, I guess, this sense of duty to them that I, I still have to finish it. But um but I think at the end of the day, it's still uh, my sense of um, just what I have to do. I've decided that this is what I'm going to do. And so I'm just going to keep doing it until it's done. Yeah, I think that's really a key thing to realize is <laughs> I think anything that you that you do because you have to do it. And, and if you game full time game developer or entrepreneur or whatever, then yeah, maybe inspired by passion initially, but a, the definition I feel like of a job is, is something you have to do to survive. Right. Yeah. Um, that's basically, that's basically what I would, that's my personal definition for it. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, I'm sure that there would be some transition, but would you say that <laughs> game development is still maybe, you know, I feel like there's, there's jobs that are, that are more bearable and less bearable. Would you say that uh, at least the kind of plan of get, getting, getting, making something your job that you at least kind of enjoy or enjoy a little bit more than what you were doing before uh, kind of went to fruition there. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, there are some times when I like when I receive feedback from the players and uh, and if somebody goes through the uh, the comments on the steam forum um, you'll see some very, very positive feedback there. And and every time I see one of those, I think, wow, that's, that feels good. I am glad that somebody is really enjoying this game. And I'm glad that somebody has played this game for 100 hours or more. And they're saying, wow, this is, this is great. And that kind of feedback really, really makes me feel, you know, at least like, well, this wasn't the biggest mistake of my life. but. Um, you know, maybe maybe this is actually going to go somewhere. Maybe I'm actually going to succeed at something. So yeah, it does help. That's awesome. I can definitely imagine that. 
hope to experience it myself when I release my first game <laughs> of just, you know, just, just getting positive, like response from something that you actually, you know, kind of envisioned and built yourself from complete strangers. That definitely seems validating. And, you know, you got 90% positive ratings in the early access. So that's also already really amazing. So as a, as a final kind of wrap up, what would be the biggest things that you've learned from your journey of, of building, um, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. Hey, Meko Saturi? Yeah, yeah. So um, <laughs> I'm sorry. You know, this is probably something that I should have uh, explained early on. Yeah. Okay. So the name is Himeko Story. Uh, the the S U in Japanese is kind of uh, shortened, so it's um, like the U. Himeko is, Story. Yeah. Sorry. So okay. Uh, so it's like story, and it's um, so it's like if you took the Himeko means princess child. So the name of the game is like princess child story. But then I'm, but it's like in Japanese that I, I translated into English and then I translated it back into Japanese and then translated it back into English. And so um, people who speak Japanese, they look at that title and they say, what were you thinking? That looks that like that's not a real word. And it's kind of an inside joke. Uh, where, you know, I, I loved the, uh, the poorly translated Japanese classics of the 90s. And so I thought, well, hey, I kind of want to make my own poorly translated classic. And so that's <laughs> where I got the name. So uh, the biggest lesson learned is it's going to take a lot more work than you originally expect. Whatever you think it's going to take, no matter how much you think you're overestimating the task, you're wrong. It's going to take a lot more. And uh, something that I read uh, somewhere was, uh, uh, if you want to know how much work it's going to take, take your worst case scenario and double it. And that, that seems to be holding true for me. And, you know, not just in terms of the amount of time required, but, you know, also in terms of, the skills that you need to develop and the uh, uh, not just the, the work that you're planning on, but things that you didn't even know that you were going to have to do. And, uh, and not just making the game, you, you spend relatively little time in video game development making the game if you're a solo developer. You have to spend so much time on all of this non- uh, video game development related stuff like like marketing your game and staying in touch with your your backers and um, speaking on podcasts <laughs> well well uh speaking on podcasts yeah but uh but you know this is um you know i think that you know this will be good for me to uh to you know, let other people know about the game, but also at the same time, I appreciate all that other people have done for me. You know, I have mm -hmm. had so many questions answered on forums and I've gotten so much feedback from other people and, uh, and people who have mentored me through so much. I think, you know, it is the least I can do to, you know, answer some questions on a forum or, or respond to a podcast and tell other aspiring video game developers what it's going to be like. So, um, I, <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, talking with you, you know, it's not finishing the game, but it's, it's something that I am very gladly doing as, you know, part of being a video game developer. Yeah. yeah and it's been, been really awesome, man. Uh, thanks so much for sharing all the really great information. I think, uh, the tip at the end, um, we're sort of making sure that you are aware that it's going to take a lot longer than you always think is kind of a recurring theme here on the podcast as well. And kind of the, yeah, things that are being shared in the community around game development that, you know, it is really hard to even just finish a game and you have to set the expectations appropriately. Yeah. Well, you are, you are very, very welcome. And I'm so glad that I was able to share a little bit of what I've learned with uh, you and your listeners. Uh, great. So Nathaniel, where can, 
what do you want people to check out that want to find out more about, you know, maybe you want to follow you on some social media or, or check out your game? Oh, uh, you know what? Um, if they want to follow Himeko Story on Twitter, then uh, you can, they can find us on Twitter. Uh, if they want to find uh, Himeko Story on Steam, uh, just search Himeko Story on Steam. Uh, it, I guess that's kind of hard to spell. Or Is the name of the game going to be on the title of the podcast? Maybe that'll be the best way for... It'll definitely be in the show notes. Uh, or description or wherever so there will be links there okay great thank you yeah I would I would appreciate that I would love it if people checked out the game awesome thanks so much you're very welcome thanks for listening to this show I hope you enjoyed it if you did please consider leaving a review and subscribing on whatever platform you're listening to for more game development content head on to moonlightgamedevs.com I hope you have a great week and join me for the next episode